This two-part interview is part of a project of the Heritage Committee of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Columbus. In conversation with me, Nancy Gilson Braverman, will be our long-term senior minister, the Reverend Dr. Timothy C. Ahrens. Tim, he's happy to be called by his first name rather than addressed with his titles, is a graduate of McAllister College, Chicago Theological Seminary, and Yale Divinity School. He became Senior Minister of First Congregational Church on January 23, 2000. He will retire from that position in October 2024 when he is 66 years old. Tim is the author of the book, The Genius of Justice, 2022, and over the years has written numerous articles pertaining to the social justice movement for local, regional, and national newspapers and periodicals. He is an authority on the life and legacy of 19th and early 20th century social justice pioneer and First Church Senior Minister Emeritus, Dr. Washington Gladden. Throughout his years at First Church, Tim has been a strong voice for social justice in the greater Columbus community, as well as throughout Ohio and the nation. He served two terms as co-president of BREAD, Building Responsibility, Equality, and Dignity, which he helped found in 1996. He has preached at churches and lectured at institutions across the country and is the recipient of numerous awards recognizing his commitment to peace and interfaith social justice action. Tim is married to Susan Sittler, and they are parents to four children and grandparents to eight children with one on the way. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. Can you describe what it was like when you first came to First Church as the new senior minister almost 25 years ago? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Um, I, I would have to say that First Church uh, was coming through um, what had been a very difficult part of its history, um, a, a contentious and combative uh, ministry that had preceded me, and they were well on the way to their next steps by the time they called me after a two-year search. So, um, but what I found was, you know, here in the heart of the city at the time, um, a church that wanted to take off. They really wanted to uh, flourish. They wanted to grow. They wanted to prosper as they had in previous generations. So I found a very receptive community uh, when I came and uh, they were ready to go. One of the things that um, we did in the very first year I was here, and it was actually written into my call agreement to come, was to do a long range plan. And the long range plan was their vision. And so I've always said, we've had five long range plans through my many years here. And it's always the vision of the people. So in a sense, my job is to uh, be the chief engineer, if you will, and, and to ride the train you know, that's, that's flying down the tracks because they've got a vision uh, that they want to fulfill. And, and it, you know, there are things that we flourished in there you know, that we just jumped right into and did well. And there are things that you know, took several different plans to get through. Um, but anyway, I, I think that's, I've always found a very forward-looking congregation, one with a lot of range in terms of people's theology and experiences, even their social status and income. You know, um, every, everyone from folks on the streets worship with us on Sunday mornings to folks in some of the key positions in the city and, and the world and commerce and business. So, so it's, a great, it's a great group of people and I've always just loved being here. One of the other things that I will say is they wrote into their job description in 1998 that they wanted the next senior minister to preach and teach the social gospel. Uh, and yeah. so it's really unusual for a church to require their pastor to be justice oriented. So that was this church, they did that, right? And so hopefully, you know, when I stepped forward and stepped 
into some of these uh, issues of our day through these years that I've been here. It's been at the church's urging um, and uh, not always agreeing with where I go, but at least knowing that we're, we're trying to get things right in terms of a society that sometimes gets things that, wrong. That so. really, I'm going to jump ahead to yeah. one of the questions I yeah. had for you later because that really keys into it. Right. Um, our church is very well known for its commitment to social justice Absolutely. and its leadership yeah. in that yeah. field. And, and you often preach from the pulpit about contemporary and sometimes political issues um, so why are you and our church different in this way? I mean, you obviously <laughs> said you were called to do this, but yeah. what else makes this? Um, well, first of all, you know, I, I look at it, Nancy, that's a great question again. I, I would say that one of the things that makes us different is, is our DNA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, it, when a church, how a church forms will determine where it goes and who it becomes. And we were formed in the abolitionist movement. Uh, as I like to say, we're the first white abolitionist congregation in the city of Columbus. And I emphasize white because there were three congregations uh, who were in the movement already that were African-American, free slaves mostly. Um, and uh, so we, in a sense, were on the coattails of our African-American brothers and sisters, which often is the case in the work of social justice, um, which is part of the glorious connection that we have to the African-American community in Columbus. But I would say our DNA was to end slavery, first, first mo movement, right, and to be a part of the Underground Railroad movement coming through Ohio. So in 1852, when 27 women and 15 men formed the original core of First Congregational Church, we already had a different makeup from day one. So again, my experience mostly has been that churches form in communities based on uh, sometimes uh, the, their national background, uh, a racial background, it might be a, a, you know, an ethnic background, um, that brings together a group of people who can all agree this will be Lutheran or this will be congregational, this will be whatever it is. And this was different. Um, so it really brought, if you will, I think the best and brightest visionaries of Columbus who wanted to see social change in 1852 and took off from there. So It sort of yeah. sends uh, historic chills up your spine. Doesn't yeah, it really it? does. I mean, I... I uh, I think about it a lot, yeah. you know, and, and we're in the time right now where we're coming up to Legacy Sunday. So we started in September 1852. So we're literally in that moment, to me, when decisions were being made about a congregation that would look different, feel different, and move differently in the community. And, and one of the things that, that I've come across in, in researching is that they had a hard time fellowshipping with other white congregations in their early years because they were, stand, they were salmon swimming against the, the stream, right? And so um, the fellowship came with the same churches that were also abolitionist churches, which were black churches, right? So, so we have this other piece that happens at the very beginning. When you stand with people, they're grateful for that and they stand with you too. And in this case, standing for black Americans uh, who had been enslaved or were enslaved um, set us apart, you know, and, and that was uncommon in Columbus, Ohio in 1852, which I, again, I agree, it sends chills through me. And I'm so proud uh, to be one of 15 senior ministers here who has served in this tradition. I mean, it's a great honor to be here, it really yeah, is. For sure. Well, people have been attracted to this church for, for different reasons, <laughs> but um, consistently I've heard members cite preaching, music, and the commitment to social justice. Yeah. So. When you craft your sermons, how do you do that, and when do you consider them successful? <laughs> um, when they're done. <laughs> so, anyway, um, yeah, uh, sermons are a strange thing. I mean, <laughs> it's like you think of a strange art form that has been going on for thousands of years. I just wrote about this a couple weeks ago, and it, it is literally something that still is happening. I mean, imagine this. There are still people in the 21st century who are willing to sit together, for better or for worse, <laughs> um, to, to listen to someone talk 
from a box over top of them for 15 to 20 minutes. I mean, that's crazy, right? So what do we, why do we give ourselves to that? So just the act. I remember the first time I preached, Nancy, when I was in Cleveland, Ohio, and I looked out at the congregation as I stepped into the small pulpit that was there. I thought, why are they here? <laughs> so, still think that every Sunday. So, um, so I think the, the, the art of preaching is, is to reach people where they are and sort of have the newspaper and the Bible, one in each hand, um, in, in bringing together a message that is relevant to this moment. Um, and that means it changes, right? I mean, you may change what you had on Monday because by Saturday night, the world just shifted in a dramatic way. Or from year to year. Yeah, from year to year, it changes. Yeah, I mean, so so trying to find the consistent themes. The other thing, though, we have, um, I, again, I count my blessings every single day. And now as I come to the end, I think I count them even more than once every single day. But um it's not everybody who can come into a space like this and be blessed by the magnificence of the space, absolutely breathtaking, right? And the music that fills the space. I mean, you know, if, so what's a successful sermon? In this space, it might be on some Sundays that you didn't even notice I talked because you, know, you were just so surrounded by uh, the magnificence of the music and the, and the art and the beauty of the space. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, I would say it's the blending of all these things that makes First Church very, very special. And the music particularly um, is so profoundly uh, powerful here. Um, and we have been blessed with some of the best and brightest musicians. And right now, True. Joshua Stafford is, in my estimation, the best. Um, and, um, you know, when Josh was doing his, his audition, I was sitting next to the beloved, blessed Denny Bernard, yeah. right? And Denny leans to me and he says, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say and not miss a word. We have just heard the Beccarat organ and the Kimball organ played better than anyone I have ever heard play them. And he had two hours to practice. He says, if you do not hire this man, I will haunt you the rest of my days. <laughs> and so I couldn't live with a haunting, quite frankly. But I mean, you know, we were blessed to have Josh come our way. And, and that it's not a mistake because we do have these two magnificent instruments that are attractive and attractions to anyone in this field of work. So, yeah. Denny Bernard also said something that I always remember. He called um, First Church the singingest church. Yep. And I have to say, in the few times in recent history that I've gone to other churches and the hymn comes on, nobody sings. Yeah. And then I think, yeah. well, we all sing. Yeah, yeah. And it's great. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. It's funny. I was, uh, we sung one of my favorite hymns that I asked Josh to play, My Life Goes On, an endless song on Sunday, but it was a different beat, a different syncopation. And I found myself like, this isn't how it goes. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to sing it in my way, right? And so by the time I finished singing, I found myself saying, this is better, right, <laughs> than the way I used to sing it. So, again, you know, I think uh, one of the things I've heard here is if you have a new hymn, people hang with it. They don't give up. They don't go silent. Uh -huh. They stay with it through the verses until they get it. And then they, by the fourth verse, they're singing yeah. joyfully. And, and, That's a know. really wonderful habit for yeah. a church to have. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And so, again, you know, one blessing upon another. So, um yeah, I think that um, we have so much as First Church to offer the community and the world um, that I can't imagine if I was looking for a church, I'd be anywhere else. Um, so, Well, you've, you've kind of implied the answer to this question, um, but if you have anything else to add, we have ex this church has existed and thrived for, what, more than 170 years. Yeah. So yep. w where's that longevity come from? I mean, you've talked a little bit about yeah. it the great things that happen here, but. Longevity, you know, the average age of a church is 75 years old in America. So I think it's very important to note that any when you hit your 76th birthday, you've outlived the average. So uh, we're, we're beyond the exception, especially in the Midwest, we're an old church, right? I mean, uh, in, in Columbus, Ohio. So I would say that um, 
I think it's that combination of uh, beauty um, uh, and power and presence. And um, there's um, not a time. I, I describe the, the glass in the sanctuary as almost kaleidoscopic mm -hmm. in terms of the time of day when, when the sun hits a certain window. And there's not, there's not a time when I'm in that sanctuary that feels like any other time that I've been there. And so I think you have in this incredible building uh, designed by John Russell Pope, uh, one of the great architects of, of his generation, nationally, internationally. Um, so you have that, you have um, a building built out of stone that's quarried in southeast Pennsylvania, for heaven's sakes, and shipped by train in the 1920s and 30s. And, you know, so you have this space that speaks for itself. Um, and then you step in. And, you know, somebody said it well. She said, when I first came to First Church, my eyes were taken up and away, and I was swept away by the grandeur. Then the music caught me, and I heard it. But she said, the best part of all is when my eyes came to the horizon, I saw the people around me. Oh, and it's lovely. the people of this church that make the difference. Denny Bernard also said very famously, um, we're going to quote him forever, but <laughs> he, he said very famously, he says, you know, not only are we the singingest church, he said the best instrument in this room are the voices of the people singing. And, and I agree. Um, so, so when you come, uh, I think it speaks for itself. I, I like to quote um, Jesus, actually. <laughs> when John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus just before John is executed, they're sent with John's question to Jesus, are you, and he's his cousin, right? But he still wants to know. I'm about to lose my head, right? Are you the one we've been waiting for, or should we look for another? And he tells John's disciples, you tell John what you see. You tell him what you experience. And that's my answer. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, is this the right church for people? What's your experience tell you? You know, just give it a chance. And um, rather than, you know, do the, 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 the most souped up uh, advertising there is, you know, um, just come and see, you know, come and see. Someone once said to me, they, the church they had belonged to reminded them of a cartoon they'd seen years before. And it shows people arriving at the gates of heaven. And there's a sign pointing one way that says to talk with God, right? And a sign pointing the other way that says to talk about God. Yeah. And she said, in my old church, I used to go over and talk about God. They were very happy doing that. In this church, people want to talk with God. So I love that. I love that image. And I think First Church embodies that. So I think that's what keeps us growing and keeps us fresh, quite frankly. Yeah. So that kind of answers my next question. Is <laughs> what, what are your tips for keeping this longevity going another 170 years? Yes. Well, I, I learned from uh, James Forbes, who was at Riverside years ago, and I spent some time with him, and he said he practiced the 75-25% rule of worship. And I, I've, I've used this often, and that is 75% <clears throat> of what happens on Sunday morning should speak to you at some level or another. 25% just toss it out. It's not going to land. And he says the problem people often make is they expect it to be 100%, and it's not going to be. So give it a chance. Let something, you know, uh, get inside of you, get into your soul, into your spirit, be received in the depth of your heart. And that counts in the 75%. For the stuff that doesn't work, you know, leave it, you know, leave it and, um, and come back and, um, but give it a chance. So I would say we have to keep producing, if you will, mm -hmm. at the, at the, uh, at the rate of 75% uh, on a Sunday for people to receive the excellence there. Um, and we think about it every week. We do a lot of work on planning worship here. It's not, it's not, it's not a mistake. In fact, we were laughing today because Sunday I screwed up with communion. You know, if, you'd think after 40 years I would get this, but I, you know. So I said, take your your elements back to your seat. So that's a, that's what we do at 9 a.m. And I said, why did I say that? <laughs> It worked, it worked out. <laughs> you know, but it's the funniest thing. It's like, it reminds me of, uh, in her wonderful book, um, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, Annie Dillard talks about, um, you know, God looking at us every Sunday and saying, they're trying so hard to glorify my name. You know, it's like, we're really trying down here. 
Um, but I think we try hard. <laughs> so yeah. we have to keep trying hard, though. It's not, it's, you know, it's, it's a day in, day out, week in, week out effort. And in a downtown setting, that's particularly important because people have to drive by a whole bunch of churches and a whole bunch of synagogues and a whole bunch of mosques and everything else to come to First Congregational Church in downtown Columbus. So it's, it's you have to have a reason to come that far. Um, and so I, I hope that this church continues to build on its excellence in all the traditions that have been strong. And the other thing is, I think we have a, um, a growing heart to care for our own and to care for others. I love what Greg Duncan did with our history. I think he really nailed it. It's this journey inward, journey outward. It's, it's a constant flow of, you know, an offering given to one different group every single week um, that we say thank you for the work that you do in caring for this world. And, and, and then we also care for ourselves and look after ourselves through Stephen ministry and other things. So I think it's a, it's, it's a constant balance of the inward journey and the outward journey. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe over, do you have like maybe one, two, three kind of remembrances of your favorite memories here at First Church? Something funny, something happy, something that just struck you as meaningful? Um. Yeah, I mean, I've so, so many. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I, I just so many memories. Um, yeah, I, I just, um, I, I would have to say, um, I, I saw this a uh, couple, a couple Sundays near the end of the choir season this last year. Um, Josh Josh Stafford's partner Stefan was helping the choir get lined up and come in and every single Sunday they seem to have trouble with their processional and he just turns and he looks up in 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 the heavens and just goes like this <laughs> and, I, and I said is that what we're supposed to do to get him to walk together <laughs> so I mean you know it's just funny I mean there's there's things that are happening and um, uh, I you know actually one of them happened Sunday my seven-year-old grandson was messing up my head as he was sitting in one of the first pews and he just kept like patting his heart and blowing me kisses while I was preaching. I couldn't look at him anymore. And then at the end of the service, he says, Grandpa, you did a good job today. <laughs> so it was really nice That's to hear. Great. So, you know, yeah. A little granddaughter, I don't know which one. Hazel? Hazel. Was, oh, oh Amron. I was watching yeah. her at the end of the service, and she was, I had never seen somebody do so many maneuvers on a pew in my life. <laughs> Upside down. Yeah. 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 So cute. Yeah, it's nice they're so big, right? <laughs> it hides little bodies somewhere in there. There's a body, there's feet sticking up. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Amron. Um, Emerin is very energetic, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I again, I have so many memories. I, you know, one of the joyful memories was our hundred fiftieth yeah. anniversary. It yeah. was a great day, uh, the day we dedicated the park, um, Social Justice Park. Um, the the day we became open and affirming, um, September eighth, two thousand two. Um, you know, in, in the anniversary year, getting to have the pastors who were living who had been senior ministers return to preach was very mm -hmm. inspirational for me. And I think it was great for the church. Um, but th again, that's been a long time ago. I, in recent memory, you know, um, for me, one of the most glorious days was coming back after sabbatical in 2021. And the congregation had been out of the space from March of 20 uh -huh. to July 1st of 21. And then I was on sabbatical. So you were all coming back in the summer of 21, but I hadn't been here, right? So this happened, we had a crossover point. And I just remember the first Sunday back hearing the voices of the congregation singing again, um, because quite frankly, um, what we do is is worship God. We don't put on a show. And during COVID, it felt like we were in, you know, this space doing our best to communicate with great folks working the controls, if you will. But no one was here. I remember Easter of 2021, we had, again, this was the second Easter into COVID. Um, we had the brass ensemble play 
And I was preaching, and during the Easter sermon, I look out, and they're all listening. And it's the first time I'd seen people looking back. It, <laughs> yeah. It's like I almost stopped my sermon. It's like, oh, they're looking at me. <laughs> you know, it's this weird sort of. So, I mean, just getting through that. And, you know, you know, if you had told me on March 8th or 9th of 2020 that we would make an announcement that would mean people would not be back in this space till July 1st or July 4th, as it turns out. Uh, 2021, I would have said that's the craziest thing I ever heard in my life. So, but again, just moving through that. The other thing is just, you know, I would say the remarkable staff that we have been blessed with through the years. It's an incredible team that we've had um, through the, throughout the years. And, um, and again, I've been blessed by some wonderful partners in ministry. So, yeah. Sure. yeah. So what have, what have been the hardest times, the challenges, the unhappy times here? COVID, obviously. Isn't, isn't yeah, happy. COVID. I mean, the for me, the unhappiness of having three ministerial staff leave in the same year, mm -hmm. um, that was heartbreak for the church. It was heartbreak for me. Um, and uh, as often happens, um, you know, the criticism was leveled at me, which is fair, you know, because... I'm the captain of the ship, right? And so um, I was the one in charge when things fell apart. So that was certainly the hardest time, probably the hardest year of my life, yeah. certainly the hardest year of my ministry. Um, and then, you know, just trying to build back from there um, to come back and stick with it and, and hang with each other and rebuild, took everything that all of us had and we did it. I mean. Are there still bumps in the road? Yeah, there are. But um, this is a very resilient community of faith. And, and we have remembered why we're here. We remembered whose we are and who we are. And I, I have loved being a part of that part of the story, too. Um, and, you know, just um, it, it's a day in, day out um, thing we have. And, and I will say this. I've always believed that the church is a very fragile organism. It's, it's, mm -hmm. It has a life of its own. It breathes. It moves. It has a spirit of its own. Uh, each church. I mean, ours as well as everyone else's. And um, it's sometimes um, hard to hold it together when it, the fragility shows because um, in most cases we see ourselves as the heirs of a powerful presence in Christ and, and in the power of the Spirit. So when, you're, when you feel fragile, when you feel vulnerable, when you feel wounded, um, it's hard to keep things together. Um, but one of the other things that I have loved about this church, but just about church in general, is that we also have the capacity to heal quicker. Um, that we have the ability to rebuild um, because of the grace that surrounds us and the love of God. So, you know, I've seen both things. I've seen the breaking points, but I've also seen the healing points. And um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a movement. But again, I think it's important to remember that we're, we're fragile in many ways, just like the human body is. Uh, the church can be fragile as well. So. But ultimately, that's what makes us better, quite frankly, sure. in the long run. For sure. I'm always amazed at, at the intellect, experience, pedigree of the ch yeah. of this church. It just every yeah. time I find something new about somebody, I think, oh, my gosh, that's right. incredible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I, I had this experience with, with one of our members um, as, as uh, Dick Ward. Um, Jane Ward's husband, Dick, was the, you know, and again, I know him later in life. I know him here. I know him as a football player at University of Chicago or something like I mean, he was in Chicago and, and you know, a great orthopedic surgeon. What I didn't know is that he founded Orthopedic One. <laughs> you know, so it's just like, what? <laughs> so, again, you know, he never told that to me. And, and we spent many hours together, right? I, you know, he talked about his... A lot his, of hips and knees. Yeah. <laughs> <in his church. laughs> like, yeah it's, 
<laughs> so it's like orthopedic what? Yeah, that's so, that's anyway, but yeah, I mean that's again the pedigree, the power, the presence of people here is amazing. So you could probably talk for you know twenty hours on this next question. <laughs> Try to distill it. A Hold it down. Yeah. What has um, Washington Gladden meant to oh. you and to this church? Um, oh man. That is that is very hard to speak to, um, in, you know in a simple way. When you came yeah. here, that you would become a Washington Gladden scholar. So here's a funny story. <laughs> so, I you know, so when I was in college at McAllister College, I led the the anti-apartheid movement and divesting the college's mm-hmm. funds in South Africa. Um, and I remember crossing campus uh, one day. I, I, poor Dr. Davis, the president of the school. He probably wanted, he needed a tunnel to get from his, his office through the campus to his home because of people like me. <laughs> hey, there's Dr. Davis. I'm going to talk to him about the board divesting while he walks home to dinner. So, so I'm walking across campus. Um, and we're talking about, you know, pulling the money out. And he says, well, you know, you can put tainted money to good use. And I said, no, you can't. I said, you can never put tainted money to good use. So I'm, I'm going, the years go by, and I'm reading something by Gladden. Actually, I'm reading uh, Jake Dorn's biography of him before I came here, which almost scared the bejeebies out of me after I read that. I thought, I, I can't do this. It's like the sword in the stone. There's no way anybody can do this job. Um, and I'm reading this statement of, of Gladden to Rockefeller, you can never put tainted money to good use. I'm going, oh my gosh, those words have been with me. Is there something in there? And it's, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to make some sort of cosmic connection. However, I think that the familiarity and the focus and the simplicity of Gladden's work um, in all of its brilliance um, was such that it, 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 it's in the blood system of America, if you will. I think it's there, right? I mean, these questions have been wrestled with before, and 100 years later, we're talking about it at McAllister College. So, But I think it, it's interesting because um, I, I, I literally love everything about Washington Gladden, so the, I just need to say that. Um, I love his roots. Um, I love where he comes from. I love his... his uh, the fact that he never had a training as a minister, he didn't. He had no theological degree. I love that groundedness. Again, you're not going to see that in the 20th century, but in the 18th century, you did. Uh, he was a writer. Really, what he was was a journalist. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and I love that. Um, I love that he um, wrote so many books, and that his he was in the words of Alexander Hamilton. You know. Why do you write like we're running out of time? I mean, he just, he was always writing, always producing, always a visionary. And seeing um, that social, social justice is, um, it, it covers the big issues on the landscape. It also covers the, the small ones. And I, I love telling this story. Um, there was a campaign called the Pure Milk Campaign, and Gladden was in, involved in this. And I, I, I thought, well, that's really nice. He was involved in homogenization and pasteurization of milk, right? Like, whatever. Anyway, so I'm going along and I'm watching this PBS special on the Poison Squad um, that talked about the Pure Milk Campaign. Mm-hmm. The pure milk campaign started because there were people taking paint and putting water in it and selling it in poor communities in different cities in the United States. Oh my yeah. gosh. They were selling paint as milk. Oh my gosh. And just the horrifying nature of that. When I'm I literally watched this clip like five times. Like that can't be. That that just can't be. So this campaign was basically shining the light on this evil, this evil act that was being done in the poorest communities in America, and exposing it for what it was, putting those folks in prison, and making milk, right, and bringing milk to those neighborhoods. So it didn't last long. But think about that. 
That is social justice, right? I mean, I love that example because it doesn't have to be epic making or it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to change everything, but it has to make what's wrong right. And that's, Gladden was committed to that. And, yeah. and, and as Christians, we should be committed to social right, justice. Right. It was a direct right. order from Jesus. Yeah, right? yeah. It's 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 so funny because you one of the things that the social gospel was really about was social salvation being equal to and just as important as individual salvation. That one cannot be separated from the other. If I only care about my salvation, but I see you hungry and I see you in need. And, you know, and I walk away from you, then I haven't been saved, right? I mean, unless, mm -hmm. unless we do it together, unless I, I step into this together. And uh, together and neighbor were probably the two most used words by Washington Gladden in all of his writings. I mean, um, you know, I, there's, there's little things too, like there was a campaign, uh, Billy Sunday uh, was rampaging the country with tent meetings and everything. He came into Columbus. This would have been the turn of the 20th century. Uh, he's holding a tent meeting down where Nationwide Arena is, actually, in that area. Hey, they built an arena. <laughs> so Anyway, so he's holding this tent meeting there, and he's calling for all of the churches to close mm -hmm. on that Sunday morning and come worship with him. He knows very well that the Catholic churches are not going to follow the orders of Billy Sunday, right? So what does that set them up to be? It sets them up to be evil, right? That they're, they follow the Pope, they don't follow Jesus Christ, right? So Gladden steps up and stands with Bishop Watterson and he says, Sunday morning is when the people of Columbus worship in their churches. He says, it doesn't matter if we're Catholic or Protestant, we're not leaving church to come to a tent meeting. And he brought, hellfire came against him for that. <laughs> Uh, from Billy Sunday and many others like well, you know, you're you're just a papist then you're not really But you know, I think that's social justice you stand with those who are the target of what is wrong, right? Uh, and 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 you and stand with them, right? I mean you don't leave them alone in those moments yeah. and you know in, in our time That's the Muslim community. It's the Jewish community um, it goes far beyond, you know, just ecumenical stuff and Christian conversations. It goes farther than that. So anyway. So he was certainly an example of courage um, from the church into the community. Right, right. Um, and have you taken some of that mantra as yours also to... Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I, th I call him the old man. <laughs> so I feel like the old man's always with me. Um, and, you know... Um, I feel as though um, I, I describe Washington Gladden um, in the book that I'm writing on him as like the Susquehanna River. And the Susquehanna River is the second longest river in America. No one knows about it really. I mean, starts in a creek in northern New York and just meanders through the east, right? And ends up in the Chesapeake Bay. I, I describe Washington Gladden a lot like the river that he grew up on. Um, that he's, you know, he's got a big name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Washington, Gladden, Susquehanna, but like the river, he just you know as as he moves through history, he continues to touch communities and lives until by the end he's called the greatest citizen of Columbus, right? And I mean, wow, that and he was a pretty simple guy. I mean, he was you know his father died when he was six. Um, he was raised by his mother and his and his uh, and her brother and his family on a farm, in you know a farm community in New York. And he literally was raised by the village where he grew up, and always stayed faithful to that village. Returning there in the summer to vacation and take his family. Um, you know, again, it's it's an amazing. He's an amazing story. So it's like that's great. Anyway, so I you know. I can't stop when I start when I think about Washington Gladden. The other the other thing is that he was just he was down to earth. Like he was writing this one little booklet called um, Young Men in the Church, right? And he went and talked to people at the living at the YMCA at that time, which it, at that time it was guys coming into the city to start a new career, right? And so he finds out the questions they have. And one of them says, you know, 
Um, I, I refuse to go to my church because I refuse to go to church because the pastor there is an idiot, right? And so he says, well, he says, if I go to the market and I ask for butter and they give me margarine and I go home and I start eating it and I go, this isn't butter, it's margarine. I don't go back to that market. I go somewhere else. He said, the same thing should be true for church. If you go somewhere and you're not fed, then go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Don't write off all of Christianity because one pastor doesn't feed you, sure. right? So again, it was very simple. Um, you know, another guy talks about he, he won't be with Christians because all Christians are hypocrites. And Gladden says, that is true. He said, all Christians are hypocrites because all people are hypocrites, right? <laughs> I mean, there's something in us. He says, but the difference is I come to church every Sunday morning and with other hypocrites there with me, we pray to God and ask for his forgiveness for the places where we've been, where we've sinned against him and one another, and we start a new week. He said, I want to be with hypocrites like that, you know? And so, I, again, I, there's nothing about him that doesn't speak to the to the common person and doesn't communicate well to everyone. I mean, he was, he was, he was very gifted in that. So do you worry about the um, what has happened to the Christian religion in the United States? <laughs> yeah, every day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. every day, yeah, I worry yeah. a lot about it. And, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, there's not a day that passes I don't wonder about how we have... What to do. Yeah, I mean, how, how and, and it's, it is, it's so many different dimensions of how we got to this place. I, I mean, there's not one thing you can say that ended us here, but um, yeah, I'm very worried about it. I'm very concerned that, and by the way, I don't think Christianity is dead. I think it's can be seen as wounded in the United States. I hope not mortally wounded, but there's places all over the world where it's growing, right? Christianity is growing, it's taking off. And the places where it's growing are places where people live that social salvation, where they look out for each other and they look out for their neighbors. And we've sort of lost touch with that. We're, we have gotten into a bunch of showboat mentality and um, you know, it's big screens and, and heavy metal and you know, it's, it's, it, is that, that's not really what we're necessarily called to do. Uh, it's great entertainment. Um, but, um, you know, as I said, this is, you know, I've said it many, many times, this is not a game that we're doing. This is um, a way of life and a way of living. And that takes dedication. Um, games you walk away from and take them up another time when you want to play. This is about life and it's about how we live our lives. So, yeah, and if we've lost that, then the show is up, so to speak. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. um, Gandhi once said, you know, I love Jesus. It's his followers I have trouble with. You know, I said, yeah, I can relate to that. So, um, you know, uh, busted. You know? Yeah. So, so, you know, I think that we have to remember the main thing, you know, and the main thing is continued faith in Christ as, as our Savior, uh, a, a sense that his way was the way that made the most sense. Speaking of, you know, make, breaking things down and making them understandable, um, you know, he, I, I like to say he's the world's greatest rap, rabbi. So, I mean, um, you know, he, he really did make things um, so that anyone could grasp it. Uh, and maybe that's where the magic of Gladden um, connected with the magic of Jesus, if yeah. you will. It's, it's, you know, to make things real for people. So, so as, as t- retirement approaches, <laughs> what's your plan? What are you going to be doing? Finishing oh, boy. Your, yeah. Your Gladden book. I, I, I must finish my Gladden book. Um, I promised the old man many times I get it done. Um, and... Um, I, you know, I, I also have his biographer, Jake Doran, gave me his library, so I really have no excuse, right? When, after Jake died and I, I was there for the service and eulogizing him, um, and we were close through the years, um, Carol called and said, you have to come to the house for lunch. It's like, yeah, lunch? Okay, so I drive over to Dayton. She said, and Jake's left you all his books! So it's like, oh no! So anyway, so I've got no excuse, right? Jake, yeah. Jake has... Uh, given me his his notes right so i can get this right 
Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I want to do that. I, I, I have some other books that I want to write. I, I wrote a book that needs pictures for Bill Willis, and it's a, it's a children's book. And I've decided, I've been thinking a lot about this, I want to redo it with his sons as a graphic novel. Oh, so yeah. so that it really speaks to young teens because it was written as sort of, you know, age three through eight kind of time. But I thought, I really want to write something that speaks to teens about this nice. guy. Yeah. Um, I was moved by, you know, John Lewis's book, March, and his the three volumes of March. And and so I thought that's a better way to, to, to tell the story. Anyway, so I've got to rework that and find a new artist. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Um, but... Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, there's some stuff I want to write. There's a, another project I'm working on uh, uh, with a friend in, who's a pastor down in Knoxville, Tennessee, called Sitting Under the Tree, and just things that we've learned through the years by sitting under the tree, so to speak. And um, Anyway, so, yeah, there's so, so there's some writing projects I want to do, and there's some other kinds of things, too. I want to travel. I, I, yeah, I, I do want to take a break i think i need a break from the local church i think the local church needs a break from me oh. after 40 years so yeah but where, i where, where will yeah. you worship that's a really good question and and you of all people would appreciate what i'm about to say um i actually have been invited by congregation beth tikva up in worthington to join them and nice. susan and i will be associate members there she'll continue it at her synagogue, but you know, it's close by so we can get connected more easily. And I'm close friends with their rabbi, Rick Kellner. So, um, but in terms of churches, that's still to be determined. I, you know, I, what I want to do is just worship where I want to worship mm -hmm. with friends who are, you know, who have been dear to me in ministry for years. So, and we'll see where I end up in church. Okay. But I will tell you this, and, and I, this part uh, unnerves me. So besides everything I just said to you in this conversation about First Church, I'm nervous about this next thing because the church I want to worship in is right here. Yeah. It's this church. I mean, yeah. this is the church that I love. This is the church that I, when I'm in it, I feel 75%. Yeah. I, feel, I feel the spirit moving. Uh, I, I love the music. I love the choir. Um, I, I just love everything about it. So it's going to be hard to walk away from my love to say, well, you know, I'll find a second best. And, and I, you know, it sounds snobby, but it just, no, but I, I, you know, I, I, I love it. And, and so that will be a challenge. And it's not just finding another church that has nice organs and stuff. It's, it's the whole package, the people, everything. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we are going to wrap this up, but we do have a part two of this interview, and wow. that will be walking through the sanctuary yeah. and having you, having the beautiful space um, kind of peak some of your memories, and we're going to yeah. describe it to us, and thanks to Rick, Rick Sayre and others, yeah. um, tell us a little bit about the history of that great space. Yeah, so we'll do that. Thank you. It's, it is it is magnificent, and I thank you for this part of the yeah. conversation. Well, is there anything that we did not talk about today that you would like to add or to to inject into this interview? Well, you know, we, we, you, you did um, a wonderful introduction about my connection to justice, and the one thing I would say is um, in the book, The Genius of Justice, I t talk a lot about um, 53 conversations with people who do the work of justice that were Jewish and Christian, mostly some that are not of any faith, but mostly Jewish and Christian. And um, the one thing that that comes to my mind is the definition of justice that I use in the book. And that is the work of justice is figuring out what was taken from whom and returning it to them. Mm. Um, and so I would hope that um, the church does that, um, that I do that, that we as individuals do that. And it, that, that phrase terrifies some people because their, their mind goes to reparations, mm -hmm. like he's just talking about reparations. I actually am, that's part of it, of course. But even more so, it's, it's you know, w when I see the politics of our time and um, just the complete inhumanity of, 
uh, people to one another and social media. And so what is taken from some people is their humanity and their dignity and their um, self-esteem. Um, and so returning that to them, you know, it's, I, I'm just aware of how prevalent that is in the times that we're living in. So, you know, I think the work of justice is, is an ongoing piece that we should all be participating in and finding places where it breaks down mm-hmm. um, and where we can make a difference. And, and I think, um, and we know it when we see it. We know when we know when someone has not been treated right. We know that. And and it's not to be silent in those moments, but to you know use the gift that we've been given. Mm-hmm. Um, to quote Washington Gladden, to wrap it up, he was <laughs> r- at the end of his days. He had had a stroke, and he was riding around Franklin Park in a carriage with um, Dr. Maurer, uh, then the senior minister of First Church, um, and his successor. And he was pointing out to Dr. Maurer again with broken speech in his right hand wasn't really functioning anymore so with his he was waving with his left hand and trying to talk to him and he would point out the different houses where people lived and he had to go see them and they needed this and the children he was telling them the story of a lifetime of serving in this city and the members of this church and and uh, dr mauer just stopped the carriage and said how did you do it he goes what he said how did you do this work of justice all your life and he said, well, he said it was the hardest work I did. Again, you know, that through broken speech, you know, he said it was the hardest thing I did. But every time I was silent, I was aware of all those who had no one speaking for them. Oh, yeah. And I had to speak again. So I, I think if we as a church embrace that spirit, carry that spirit forward, um, We'll continue to make a difference in Columbus and the world, you yeah. know, um, because there will be those who have no voices, and and we need to keep adding ours. So, Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you. This has been fun. Thank you.